please welcome Sini. And you have the magic device. Exactly. Yes, thank you. Okay, excellent morning to everyone who managed to wake up despite yesterday. And uh, I'm Sini Ruohoma, uh, and my job involves securing critical infrastructure. I happen to focus on communication infrastructure, uh, so I work at Ericsson. And I happen to use uh, crypto as one of the tools for securing things, but my happiness is in securing critical infrastructure. Uh, this is uh, the presentation is partially based or mostly based on actually uh, joint work with Tero Hannola, whose uh, master's thesis I've been supervising. Um, so the outline is I have the compulsory what on earth does Ericsson do with crypto slide uh, and then I have the actual presentation contents, contents which involves complaining about stuff, complaining about stuff some more, and then sort of trying to guess what we might be able to maybe do about this and kind of what it's based on and then some conclusions. Advertisement slide. So uh, Ericsson has a PKI, public key infrastructure product, which is made for telco grade uh, installations. So we are mostly, uh, we are not making phones anymore, use flash. We are making mostly, uh, like maybe we are most known for now is the radio base stations, which make the phones work. So we are doing the cri uh, critical infrastructure behind that makes all kinds of things connected. And telco systems are a very traditional, sort of very regulated industry, which has millions of subscribers and lots of geographical coverage. Um, and they have high capacity and availability requirements. And uh, we are making a turnkey uh, PKI solution based on EJBCA, which is, has take, kind of takes all the nastiness out that we can take out and none of the ones that we can't take out. Um, and then we have the global presence to back it up. So we have uh, a large um, service organization to actually provide uh, support for this. We also use PKI in various internal uses. I'm not here to brag about all the cool stuff we do here, but uh, I'm kind of mostly involved in that side. Uh, I'm doing crypto nerd things. Um, and um, we are like, we, because we both have a Swedish background, we have a very nice uh, synergy going on with the uh, prime key in this sense as well. Yes. The presentation, like this is mostly going to be very kind of self-ironic, not, not primarily based on what, we exa what exactly we do in Ericsson, but things I'm observing kind of everywhere. I'm f strong, very strongly identifying with our like making stuff out of crypto community. And I'm kind of seeing certain kinds of patterns that we like tried to express in this thesis. It's by, by the way, it's being finalized. I don't have a link for you yet, but you can uh, send me an email and I will send, send a link once it's, once it's up, it's going to be public. So the, when we're first making a system and we're proud of our babies and we find out like, it's totally working in my lab also, like I'm making a PowerPoint scenario maybe uh, that it has, it's going to be a great system. It has some awesome crypto. <coughs> it works great in my lab. <clears throat> then my plan is deploy it into the wild and then says step three profit and we don't see anything going wrong with this ever, right? There are some real world considerations that are very very unfortunate that we have to sort of run into which many of them are very boring in the sense that they don't have anything to do with crypto uh, but there's um, in our case if you have a radio base station you might m end up mounting it on a very very tall pole in a very complicated environment where you don't get to go there and press the reboot button if something goes wrong or do stuff with the maintenance port very easily or replace the hardware very easily. There's various considerations that, uh, for example, ENISA has a nice, uh, nice report on this. Uh, as a di digested thing, we might think about software security. How do we handle updates, software updates? Recently, uh, we've had more problems with hardware security coming up. We, we are paying more attention. The problems were always there. Hardware is quite insecure, and now we are kind of noticing that and pay attention to that. That's more, there's going to be more of that coming. Physical security, well, it's maybe not, not so huge a problem when you are mounting it on a pole on a time before anyone has drones. Uh, but you might want to consider things like someone might for fun uh, fire at your radio base station with a shotgun, and then you need to cover that kind of uh, scenarios as well. Uh, configuration, it's like everything else uh, that the uh, customer can basically do with your thing once you have shipped it off. Uh, what kind of networks it, is it put into? Is it exposed to the internet uh, directly or is it in a uh, sort of protected network? What kind of users can you let allow access it? And what kind of environment is it in, in general? 
Of course, there's also the cryptography and various kinds of protocols that you need to consider. That's just one aspect. Interoperability is one big thing uh, that's in many cases, for example, in the uh, telco in industry, you can run into the thing that it needs, to start, it needs to keep working. So we don't get a nice migration that, hey, we finished 4G, maybe there's some security downgrade problems. We're going to get rid of all of those. We're going to just have 5G starting tomorrow. Only 5G phones, right? Works great. Yeah? No one has any problem with this? So we have some um, problems from that as well. Challenges, opportunities, I mean. Uh, then we have uh, supply chain security is coming up more and more, and this is also something that we haven't been paying attention to. Once you secure your endpoint, like we, uh, we might be serving stuff for reason, like customers who might have enemies with lots of, well, not enemies, opportunities with lots of um, budget, uh, and instead of hacking them directly, they might be interested in hacking us as their supplier. So we, for example, need to sign everything that we ship to them for like tamper evidence and so on, and have been doing that for a while. Um, there's human factors, and this is also something that we as technologists, we like to ignore. The human is just someone who fails to follow documentation, but they're actually like real things with minds of their own, I've heard. And, <laughs> and also, um, one, th one more thing that is also coming like more interesting these days is what your product security capabilities and uh, how, do you, how do you kind of ensure situational awareness. In other words, when you get hacked, are you actually able to tell today, tomorrow, next year, maybe in 10 years, maybe never? Everything's working fine, so we must have, must have not been hacked, right? So now I'm going to complain about I make a perfect system, or you make a perfect system, and it's awesome. Software is really fast, and it only has well-known vulnerabilities in it. And it's really easy to use securely, at least by Bob, who designed it. I'm not sure about anyone else. You can run it on this super hardware that's really secure and awesome, and it got broken last year. How are you going to replace it when it's on a pole for the next 30 years in some, somewhere in the middle of nowhere? You can also test, test and patch instantly. No one can, but you've made it a perfect system, so now you can test and patch it instantly. Then your supply chain is hacked. You're downloading stuff straight from some Python library, nice li uh, library server, and someone's hacked those, or your other uh, operating system package provider or so, whoever. And then your crypto breaks and your keys leak. I have a little bit more about that. Uh, do you have any kind of crypto agility or key renewal plan for your perfect system? Then the, the eventual question is, can it actually talk to my other things, like this 5G, 4, 3G, 3, all the Gs uh, problems? Uh, there's legacy systems that you need to interface with, and you want to make changes that might break backwards compatibility. Can you actually make those changes? Who are you going to break? Who are you going to mess with? Whose happiness are you taking away by breaking backward compatibility? Probably mine. Um, and eventually, like once you have a perfect system, then you have to expose it to the world, which is always nasty, like your perfect uh, shiny baby. You have a bad engineer who misconfigures it in a way that you completely didn't intend to use. And then eventually a bad attacker comes and hacks it, and you're a part of a botnet and you never find out because you don't have any security uh, awareness capabilities because you were never going to get hacked because you had a perfect system, of course. So yeah, this compl complaints, complaints, complaints. But at least, hey, I'm a crypto person. I love crypto and my crypto is a solution and not a problem, right? But it's horribly stressful as well. So <laughs> I, had, I had to ask, add a question mark to the perfect crypto because I couldn't, couldn't keep my poker face for long enough. Your randomness is about as predictable as the pattern on my shirt. You, it looks random, but it's not. And it barely passes your oldest test for randomness. It has a bias this or that way, left or right. Your keys are generated based on that, so your keys are predictable as well. Um, you're going to find out that your uh, crypto doesn't work with your anything, because, uh, for example, the hardware that you're trying to uh, store the keys in supports everything as long as it's from the 70s. Um, your algorithms are broken. Now you're going to be able to deploy your crypto with patched padding or hash version 666C. Your keys are always too short, or everything is taking too long. And don't even get me started on post-quantum. Once you have keys that are um, long enough, 
you need to start running it on super accelerators so that you can get any kind of speed out of it. And it's still going to be all incredibly slow, especially in the case of RSA and now these new coming um, algorithms. Of course, also, uh, you have a bad developer who misimplements it in a way that you completely didn't intend to be used. And you have side channels everywhere, so, you know, like sound and radiation and how much has this used power and all kinds of bad thoughts and other things that you might run into. And eventually, you run into the problem that there's somewhere in your system, there's some kind of irreplaceable keys or irreplaceable other magic. So you find out that your entire system is depending on a root of trust eventually that is a single giant turtle and you're going to be screwed if that turtle kicks the bucket. So I want to, like one take home message from all the complaining I'm going to do, I want you to sort of understand all of you that crypto does not solve anyone's problems but it transforms them into other problems. And then some of those are hopefully solvable, so you can maybe chip away at your major problem, which is mostly the pursuit of happiness and things in the way of that. So, <laughs> yes, the key management is a major thing. It's kind of, if you want to simplify crypto very much, it transforms your confidentiality problem into a key management problem. It transforms your integrity problem into a key management problem. And on the other hand, you can also see that, at most, your, your system is going to be as secure as the private keys. So do you actually know where your key assets are, where they have been, and who has been using them, and when? Your system integrity is going to depend on your trust anchors. How do you change your expired or compromised root key when it's in the field, on top of a pole? Your system is, at most, as available as its private key. This is something that we might often forget. Now that we are encrypting everything, you are not going to get into that encrypted data if you lose the keys. So key management is much more important when, than when we were doing this back, back in the nice times when we didn't have to encrypt anything and we only encrypted things for fun. Once we start encrypting everything for reals, like try to, for example, if you have a TLS connection and you, you're, you have a box that you might not be able to connect to your CA all the time, because it's not internet connected. So consider how are you going to connect to your trusting party if your ex authentication key was expired or should be revoked because it's bad otherwise. And your updates is another side of availability, also depend on your private keys. When you're signing your software, if you're validating software, you're only ru running vali uh, validated sign signed software, try to update that without a valid signature. There, have you heard about this company that had a nice problem that uh, they had a very, very good engineer uh, working for them. And they got very disgruntled. So as they left the company, they deleted all the private keys. I hope you haven't heard about them. I'm going to pretend that I didn't hear about them as well. It's not us. <laughs> it's not us, really. <laughs> but we hear about th these things. So the conclusion from all this complaining is that we are going to need some tools. And um, the thing that we focused on in the thesis was communication tools, because I noticed that we have, in many situations, we have these repeating, uh, repeating things that come up, and communication really is, I agree completely with Scott, uh, communication is one of those key important things that you need to consider when securing systems. It's not about your technology, it's about your communication, really, in the end. And once that's fin figured out, we can communicate about the other tools. Part two. So my focus here is empowering teams that do the actual work because I've also mostly I watch those people and not my management. The management is awesome, but yeah, they don't really work. They might write nice papers that say that we always do things right. So we want to secure systems and not just sort of look secure in the marketing material. But unfortunately, a lot of securing, especially in our traditional industries uh, and hierarchical companies in general, uh, they're based on standardization, certification, corporate practices, that have the kind of the target user is your manager and other external actors such as your auditors. So you have a model where you're pr producing lots of documentation. I'm kind of almost agreeing with Scott, but not quite. And you have this planning head that writes the perfect documentation. This is how we're supposed to be doing. And then you have the dumb limbs, the, your actual teams who are, at, let's say that they're standing here, your management is standing here, and they're writing like, yes, we will always do things right, and then we're going to ship this document to the operat operators and, and other guys who are actually running the system, and they're going to get hit in the forehead with it. And after that, they're going to do everything right, right? But not. Um, so 
I'm sort of trying to understand what is the purpose of this kind of models and why, are, why do we have auditors whose interests might not be sort of completely aligned. Could it be that we're using certifications and that kind of things as some kind of advertisement that, it's, that we make ourselves look good? We can sell to a government contractor as long as our certifications are fine. It doesn't actually matter if our teams are doing that thing. And we are running into this pr problem when trust doesn't actually, is misplaced that your documentation looks great and your teams maybe don't even speak the same language as the papers that they were given that say that everything is done correctly. So you need the teams to actually also be smart. So think about it like this. Uh, if we are walking on a street where the, the street is the world of crypto, and there's lots of ice on it, which is uh, advanced persistent threats and other things, and you slip on the ice. And at this point, you're not going to be able to have a consultation meeting workshop with your head, thinking like, okay, what do I do? Maybe I'm going to move this leg here and sort of fail, like successfully not fall on my ass. But instead, you would like to have your limbs kind of have good dancing moves so you can, you can catch yourself without falling down. And that is not going to be run very well with your smart head, dumb limbs uh, option. Because right now we are run, like we, because we are, are running into change all the time, everything needs to be agile all the time, and still we need security. So your dumb limbs, who are, you are not trusting, by the way, you're writing them the document of how to make things right, and then give it to them because they can't do it themselves. But now you need to kind of enable the teams to do it because they're the ones who are going to be slipping on the ice all the time. It's not your management who wakes up in the morning to notice that unnamed country's unnamed leader has come to visit and wants some money off your bank, for example, to finance his operations. So how to enable the team to drive security? And the basic idea, there's like a whole thesis about this, but the basic idea is uh, structure is good, chaos is bad. Agile has lots of chaos, but structure is good and chaos is bad. You have three things you can structure. I you want to structure all the things. Uh, your system, I divided these, like I had to make this very high level because I needed to fit it into a thesis. So your system is all the non-human bits that you actually control. So if you can configure it in a certain way, if you can code it in a certain way, then it's part of your system. If you can make your co uh, doors open in a certain way, that's also part of your system in my definition now for simplifying things. So what you want to do there is you want to implement and test and maintain it in a sensible way and make your system comprehensible because you can only control what you can understand. For example, you have a clear architecture, you know what, what different parts are connecting to, and your documentation is useful. Our documentation is always useful, of course. Um, second part is what you want to uh, structure is your human work. This is actually much more major than we, what we are considering usually. You want to cut down cognitive load everywhere you can. One of the major, major uh, sort of problems that are causing problems, is, uh, the causes of problems, root causes of problems, um, you have the sharp end and the blunt end of problems. Like you have some per person operating under major pressure. Lots of other people have screwed up first, but there's someone who's working under major pressure at 4 a.m. with a broken system, and they are going to be under lots of cognitive load. So you want to plan ahead, you want to eliminate the need for that guy to be superhuman. And for example, like this is actually worked out in other fields. You have a pilot, you, your pilot has a checklist. They don't improvise every time like, okay, how do I start up this plane? They actually have something that stops them from needing to think very carefully and remember all the things. And for ex like from an IT perspective, you would want to have correct and relevant alarms instead of being spammed by all the possible alarms just in case some of them are useful and then having to sort of filter all of them. That takes cognitive load and we have very limited CPUs really. And then the other things, this is something that I really also want to under underline. I want to underline everything in my presentation, of course, but you want to also consider and structure the environment, like all the things you cannot control. If you can't, control the way your data center's outer perimeter is protected because you're lending it from someone else. That's part of your environment. You need to understand your environment and you need to understand your threat model, which are also the guys who you can't control who are coming, coming over to take over your system, for example. And the hurricane that's going to come over and have, have its way with your system as well. So as an example, major example, analyze your risks so you can direct your prioritization of what you actually protect against. As a bonus thing, which I don't, uh, I could have a second talk about this, 
I'm into, into getting more human resources into security because we need more human resources in security. So you can come talk to me about that. Um, now I have like um, to try to make this more concrete because it's a very, very high level model in a presentation this short. I'm going to try to uh, provide some examples of how you could be applying this, uh, basically. Uh, three kinds of use cases in a different size teams. I'm using team in a rather wide sense, by the way. Uh, how can you control risks in a PKI deployment? How, you can, how do you handle security incidents? And then evaluating some tools that, that someone's try to, trying to sell you either internally or externally. Like, does it cover my threat scenarios, actually? So the aim of the framework, which you can keep in, in your mind, is to provide a shared language and structure for discussion and planning. PKI deployment is an example. By the way, now I have uh, like a belated suggestion for, for a slogan for the tech days. Public key infrastructure, now with more tentacles and face hugging. Do I get a pie now? <laughs> anyway, so uh, like uh, the analog of baby aliens and PKI is kind of uh, comes from the fact that if, if you're setting up a PKI, you don't quite sort of maybe know what it is all about. You might be tempted to sort of have a consultant come and help, help you set it up. And then the consultant will go away. Then your baby alien is going to hit teenage and he's going to start face hugging everyone. And your consultant is far away. So don't buy baby aliens from passing consultants. You need to make sure that you're, you know how to parent a baby alien before you let that consultant ever leave your building. So structured system, understand your system. Do you know what your PKI monster has eaten and what its keys can do at worst case, for example? Structuring the human work. Does your team have a clear plan of how they renew the keys or have an emergency revocation of keys 10 years from now when your keys are probably still in use? And structured environment, you need to understand who wants your keys, what do they want it for, and any bus factors that you have in your team, as in if someone gets hit by a bus, how badly does it affect your PKI? I avoid all buses. <laughs> Just kidding. I run, I can, I can drive in buses all day long. I don't have any problem because we don't have any bus factors, of course. Um, a second example is security incident handling. So sometimes there's brown things hitting your fans. Structured system-wise, how are you able to, for example, shake the relevant information out of your system in a hurry because you're going to work under pressure when you have a security incident? And another thing would be like, what kind of precautions do you have in place that you maybe wouldn't have a security incident in the first place? So these kinds of things you can think about when you're trying to structure your system. When you're structuring your work, you're, everyone's going to operate under major pressure, time pressure, so things that they are going to need. Does everyone know who to contact? Who can they pull in to clean up the mess? And when is an emergency like ongoing and when is it past? Is it like still okay that they're still mining Bitcoin in your system, uh, but it's kind of the temperature is under control? Is that the, when, when the emergency is passed? A structured environment, uh, you want to plan ahead for likely attacks, security failures, and those kinds of things. There's lots of documentation and studies out there already on what kind of things go wrong with everyone else, so we don't have to make all those mistakes again ourselves. And this helps you mitigate risks that are identified as most serious. And one example that is close to my heart is, like, there's someone who says that maybe tool X can solve this, and you want to kind of try to be able to understand, like, well, okay, does this help at all? So uh, we, you can evaluate. I can, I'll show you a small, bigger version of the table uh, in the next slide. It's uh, for illustration here only. There's a great tool set uh, for hardening and defense and so on that's called the SIS controls. And um, you might be thinking that, okay, once I've applied this, then I'm secure. It's a bit like I'm applying crypto, so now I'm secure. But you can also apply sys in a, and then feel secure. It focuses on system configuration things, and it does look into software, and it does look a little bit into human work. But the uh, viewpoint is limited for like reasons you, don't, you can't do everything great anyway. It has very little attention to environment, uh, somewhat thin coverage on this uh, human work structuring in general. And things that are looking neglected are physical hard, um, hardware security, interoperability, supply chain issues, and the human factors, of course. And now you can sort of, uh, once you know what it covers and what it doesn't cover, you can look, look at other tools that can fill in the, your remaining gaps. And this makes, hopefully, conversation about tool sets much more rational and less uh, who gets the shiniest t-shirts from the provider. Your t-shirts are awesome, by the way. <laughs> Yes, so this is just an example. So we went through the controls and mapped them. So this is the 
um, list of uh, real-world aspects that I listed in the start of the presentation mapped into the structure, all the things, environment, human work, and system. And you can kind of see that it's heavy on certain things and very light on the other things. And I just bundled together the rest so I could make the font bigger that are co completely not covered. So in conclusion, uh, take-home take messages. Uh, we do PKI awesomely. That's all obviously a take-home message. Uh, but also, crypto is something that transforms problems into new ones. It's not a solution at, by itself. And one of the major things that you need to deal with after that is key management. You want to pay lots of attention to your key management when you are deploying real serious crypto systems. Meanwhile, all the remaining security problems will also impact you. So you need to consider those as well. They're all the boring things, because they're not involved all in crypto, which is the exciting part of everything. But they still need to be addressed. And you will want to have defense in depth, because your crypto is going to fail as well. And uh, this um, whole model of how to solve things is based on a need to support the autonomous teams who are standing very far away from management. Management might be in Sweden, and your teams might be in Finland, <laughs> in some case, uh, in other places. And try to kind of allow them to operate in a way that uh, allows them to solve the problems that they are actually dealing with on, in their everyday work. Because your communication is not going to be perfect, so therefore your documentation in this end is not going to be perfect. You're going to need something perfect in that end as well. And it's based on the three, three structured things to like fight back chaos, which is my main number one enemy. Uh, it's an, the anti-happiness. Structured systems means that you can only control things that you can underst understand. And the more you can understand your system, the better you can control it and understand the weaknesses in your system. So for example, that security probing is going to be a very good thing to do in-house as well. Structured work to address the blunt end of human error. So not just the guy who is working under pressure, but also all the other things that will go wrong before, a f for, before for example, a plane falls down. It's not the pilot who screws up in some cases. It might be a pilot who does very, like, very interesting things. But there's many things that fail before that, because you can't just sort of generally drive a plane where you want. And structured environment, like the, all the things you can't control, understand what you are protecting from, understand your context, and work from there. After this, I have solved all our problems. So now you can ask questions and make comments. Thank you. Perfectly on time. I'm so proud. <laughs> yeah, crypto can be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, I didn't have a question. Uh, so, uh, how long does it take to fix a bad deployment when it's uh, been put out into production in the real world? Of course, it's <laughs> hard to say. Uh, <laughs> But do you have some anecdotal uh, data to share with us? What's the shortest time and what is, uh, I guess, the longest time Bad is infinite? deployment, yeah. Hmm. I can't give any kind of general answer on that. Um, I know when I break things in my home computer, it sometimes takes months to fix, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, some, some deployments uh, you can make, uh, make things, you can have fail, um, uh, things that recover from failures. We usually have sure. to have things that recover from failures very fast. So in that case, if you have a kind of, for example, an upgrade that goes bad, then you can just reboot and be happy again. But um, if you have something that really goes wrong, then of course it, you might have to wait for spare parts. You just burn the old, all, all the ones you had and so on. So it could take ages as well. So it's nothing that uh, a crypto can help us with? <laughs> no. <laughs> crypto makes it harder. <laughs> that means lots of work for us. Everyone's Excellent. life becomes harder with crypto, but also the attackers. So it kind of, then you hope that it balances out. Great. Uh, the, somebody uh, put a question on a slide, though. Uh, how do you suggest to bring structure in a DevOps team to improve security? Uh, structure in? Devop, DevOps team. What was the question word for this? Excuse me? Uh, the, the start of the sentence. Um, how do you suggest to bring structure? Bring structure into a DevOps team. 
uh, what would be kind of, I think this would probably be, like a DevOps team is always developing new features. Uh, so then you will, will want to know, um, it, part of your planning meetings, for example, you would want to look into uh, kind of mini risk assessments are, are maybe the easiest concept to communicate in five seconds here. Uh, so that when, when, you're, when you're making something new or make, thinking about how to make it, make a little risk assessment with your team, like on the what, what does it actually do, what can it break, and so on. That will bring you some sort of idea about environment. Try to look at it from the, from the point of view of system work and environment. And use the table if it's a bigger feature. But if it's a tiny, tiny thing, then you don't want to do a heavy thing every time. Sure. I don't have a structured su suggestion for you yet. Master's thesis part two coming up. Who wants to come and get supervised on that? Yeah. Uh, I guess kind of a little bit connected to this, uh, uh, the last question would be, do you think there are, or are there going to be some better, if they are not, standards, regulations, or guidelines to help us prevent bad real-world deployments and implementations? We've tried this uh, standardization regulation and so on. We have lots of those. Um, some of them, some of them help. So the, you're kind of encoding good practices. NIST has, for example, lots of deployment instructions on how you how do you do things properly. There's lots of documentation and certification in that sense already in existence. Um, ISO 27000 can help you establish risk management in your organization in a sensible way if you're doing it in, uh, for purposes other than just documenting that you're claiming to do it. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's there's lots of good things we can use. But as long as if we have like different silos in organizations that are some people are using it because they want to show it to the outside world and for themselves that yes we are always doing things right, and then you have a like system admins that are look reading at the yes we are always doing things right but how, then you are not going to have like a working solution right out of that standard. So the standard won't solve your problem. It might help you look in the right directions if you are reading it carefully enough. Or maybe to, to structure the, the way how we fail. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> structured <laughs> failure. That's also good because you're going to fail. You want to fail in a sort of controlled way. <laughs> Fall on your ass and not on your wrists because you're going to break the wrists. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't look at the audience. Anybody has a, has a questions? please uh, raise your hand if I'm not seeing them or if, if Thomas is uh, not seeing you. Not necessarily a question, but maybe a comment to yes. engage in some dialogue. <laughs> I pretty much loved everything about that presentation, by the way. Um, that was awesome. Um, audit mm. and auditors. Yeah. And whilst I agree with what you're saying, I, I think there is a large amount of, hey, this is a badge that I can present to somebody to say that I did something, or I have to check a box yes. so that I qualify to do something. But uh, I always like to see the auditors really as the people who are second checking me. Yes. So, you know, true audit is something that you're doing yourself, and then you get some independent third party to come in to verify that you actually are mm. doing everything that you say. So that was just one comment. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, auditing, auditing is by itself, it's a very good activity, and the idea is great. Sometimes we have like an incentive problem that. Uh, um, auditor might not actually have a vested interest in your system. So we actually we use internal auditing, uh, auditing a lot in the sense that you get a third party who is not involved with your system but understands your system and comes and breaks it and kicks your ass for doing things not the way you want to do things. And also, uh, so then you can do things better. And also, one of the things in audit, uh, the, the audit system itself that is completely outside track of this, uh, you want to control the audit system as well because there's lots of uh, there's, for example, data leaks that can happen from a, a sort of a side. Uh, an auditor comes into your company and says, give me all your data. I shall look through it and I shall know if you are worthy. <laughs> but then you have all the data and then they're going to store it in. <laughs> Where are they going to store it in? And then it might leak from there. Yeah, sorry. When they come audit us, they, they can't walk off with data. Yes. They can sit there good. and they can you do have it while we're watching your system. them. <laughs> but they can't go other places. Um, and the other comment that I wanted to make was about the, you know, the people at the one end of the chain of the SOPs, if you like, who are doing minute things that are very structured that probably mm. don't take a lot of thought if mm. we've documented them yes. well enough. However, I, I think those, you know, if you're running a commercial PKI, for instance, you know, just about 
every action you're doing should be controlled pretty much by two-person controls. And, <laughs> and so somebody has to be very well versed in exactly what they are doing to the letter for their actions from a consistency perspective, but they also have a responsibility to know what their counterpart is doing mm. so that uh, they can check that there is sanity about what they're doing. So the people who are at that end of the spectrum still need to have a high level of understanding yes. about what it is that they're doing. Right? right now we are going to need three people who know what they're doing. The guy who writes what they're supposed to do and the two guy, one guy who is doing it and the one guy who is op observing what he's doing because if, you, if the only one who knows what they're doing is the one who's writing the documentation, surprise, you can get all kinds of things happening in your PKI system suddenly. Right? Like, yes, yes, you just press this button here, it's completely safe, it's fine, trust me. Yeah, start to be funny. Uh, <laughs> what, what's your, uh, what, in your opinion, should be the definition, and um, by transitive property, also a declaration of a disaster or emergency? Ah, it's ah. a wide concept. Um, I think I consider like every little thing a security incident, but uh, sometimes you have a major disaster. I've been, I have very educative dreams about what would happen if uh, all of Helsinki area got hit by a 20 meter tsunami <laughs> and then try to solve that problem. Um, but uh, disasters, uh, Interesting disasters. There's lots of interesting disasters. What can I talk about that is not too interesting? Um, huh. I think one of the great, great examples that I love from uh, late days is the, is the news about the unnamed organization that had, uh, had an actual like uh, insider attack that deleted all their private keys. So they w were unable to make any software updates anymore. That is a, like a major disaster. They eventually recovered from it by s requesting that everyone basically installs from scratch and wipes the uh, old trust anchors. And that was that was a major thing. And then, like, then you want to have some kind of you want to have a dis disaster recovery plan. Like, how do you recover from the instant thing that? Your HSM is on fire, what do you do, what do you do? And then you have, want to have a business continu continuity plan on once you put out the fire on the HSM, like what then? Like how do, how do you rebuild from the, from the ashes, so to say, rise so we, like a phoenix? We do like a clean install. Hmm? We do a clean install. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you don't have anything one. in the field. You don't have anything with the, in the field with your trust anchors in it, so you don't need to worry about it. You can just do a clean install. <laughs> but you, would, you will want to, of course, have backups which you can restore into your HSM afterwards and so on. Well, thank you very much. I think this was totally awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Starting us up with the... Thank you. I won. I won. <laughs> so I will we'll just try to.